Welcome to Om Times TV, a division of Om Times Media and Broadcasting. Sex is the life force energy that runs through us all. The link between sex, creativity, and the sense of aliveness is strong. Can you use sexual energy for your spiritual evolution? or perhaps for emotional healing. Is it even possible? Clinical sexologist Dr. Martha Tara Lee will explore all these and more on the Eros Evolution Show here on Om Times Radio and TV. Hello, hello, and welcome to Eros Evolution. I'm with Dr. Lee Phillips. So my last name is Lee, his, uh, and uh, they are, uh, his first name is Lee, okay? So <laughs> so Lee and Lee meets. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay, anyway. Lee and Lee. <laughs> yeah, Lee and Lee. <laughs> Uh, okay, so uh, today's um, title is uh, Sex Therapy with Chronic Illness and Disability. I'm so happy to be uh, shedding light on uh, this topic, which is one of my big passions. I uh, Okay, but be, um, before I talk about myself, so what we're going to do is uh, we will be discussing how individuals and couples juggle the needs of being ill and disabled, uh, how uh, individuals and couples cope with the inadequacy and shame due to the illness and disability that they experience, and how we we can all uh, reclaim our sexuality so a little bit about lee phillips before we we go on into the show so dr lee phillips uh, is in private practice in uh, new york city and uh, virginia where he specializes in chronic illness and sexual dysfunction so he is a very qualified licensed clinical social worker in many cities uh, washington uh, Washington, Maryland, Virginia, and New York, and a certified uh, sex therapist uh, with the American Association of Sexuality Educators, Counselors, and Therapists, uh, which I'm also a member of, um, but I am a certified sex educator. So basically, um, in the whole hierarchy of uh, people who uh, support people in sexuality, like a certified sex therapist would be like considered the highest uh, level. And uh, so Dr. Phillips has been uh, in private practice for more than a decade, treating a uh, diverse group of patients uh, searching for relief from the complications re resulting from the uh, debilitating and often overlooked combination of illnesses. So you can look for Dr. Lee Phillips on uh, the website, uh, www.drleephillips.com, uh, two L's, and uh, Dr. Lee Phillips on uh, Instagram and Facebook. So welcome. Hi, thank you for having me. I'm so, I'm <laughs> thank so, you. Excited, I'm so excited to be with you. <laughs> yeah, I, I love you so much. I've been following oh. your work. We've been following each other forever. We have. Um, we have. Yeah, yes, yes, at least mm -hmm. three years. And um, you, I mean, oh. yeah. So, so I looked at what what uh, you do, um, and you've really ramped up on your Instagram and the mm. educational message you put out. So I'm so happy about it. Good. So, um, yeah. so I understand that uh, uh, you you came into private practice. Um, like your own practice, you know, previously was with mm -hmm. other practice in the last one year. Am I right? I, yes, you're, you're absolutely. Wow. You, you have been following me. Um, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Last year I started my, it's actually the anniversary date just passed. So I've been in private practice on my own for about a year now. So I was with a group private practice prior. So yeah, I started my practice March of last year. Yeah, it's, it's really mm -hmm. different when you are part of another group and uh, yeah. when you do your own practice because now you are uh, not just doing the work, you have to do all the other admin and your own marketing. It's a lot. And I've hired some people to help me now. You know, I think it takes a village when you when you have your own practice and you're doing the, the marketing and everything else that goes with it. You're doing the administration part of it and then you're also doing the therapy which is the best part of it right so it's, <laughs> <laughs> that's the part it that is I, it is yes it that's is, the part that is. i love yeah yeah so i've been yeah very, so very the, all the other stuff is uh stuff that we're not paid for exactly <laughs> <laughs> well, we do it anyway and now uh besides being sex educators and sex therapists uh mm -hmm. for you um we also have to be entertainers we are entertainers, absolutely. Especially when you have your own business, right? I mean, you're you're hitting the ground running. You're out there doing the legwork, and 
it's it's busy. I've got two offices, you know, Washington D.C. and New York City. So I'm staying very busy. So it's it's all it's all a blessing though. It's been it's been a great ride so far. So mm -hmm. doing the work yeah. that's needed. Yeah. So so tell us. Uh, I know you've been doing this for ten years now. So uh -huh. uh, more than ten years, I'm mm -hmm. sure. So what got you into it? You know, I I started and I used to uh, be a geriatric psychotherapist. So I saw folks that were like 70 and older. And when they were coming in, they had chronic pain conditions. And a lot of them had conditions due to a chronic illness. And one of the things that they kept talking about was how they no longer feel sexual or they want to be sexual and they don't know how to be sexual or, you know, how to reclaim their sexuality. And so then I started seeing younger folks that were coming in. And by that point, I moved to DC and I met someone who was teaching a, a building your private practice workshop. And she asked me, she said, you know, what do you specialize in? And I said, chronic illness, disability, chronic pain. And she said, have you ever thought about becoming a sex therapist? Because people really want to learn how to reclaim their sexuality or be sexual. And I said, no, but that sounds very interesting. So that's when I started the ASEX process was through that. And then I just combined, you know, sex therapy and chronic illness and disability together. And so that's where it all really started um, back in 2017. So yeah, and I've been specializing in that since. So it's mm. been a, a great experience so far working with all different types of clients, all different types of couples, or people in relationships that have you know, chronic illness that are wanting to explore their sexuality, you know, and to reclaim their sexuality, being in the new normal of all sorts. And so I really help, you know, my patients identify what does that look like to them. I'm so, so glad they have you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's it's such great work. And, and, and you know, you know, in sex therapy, it's so broad and what we do. And I think being able to um, combine, you know, working with illness and disability with sex, I think is amazing. Because a lot of these uh, patients, they go to their doctors and their doctors don't talk to them about sex, right? So after I get a cancer diagnosis and I've done my cancer treatment and now I want to be sexual, how do I go about doing that? You know, my doctor doesn't talk to me about sex. So that's where people come and find me. And it's been very rewarding. Yeah. Yeah. So I, I also work with uh, people with cancer and disability. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I've been the locum sexuality counselor with Singapore Cancer Society here wow. uh, for the last four years. And uh, then also started to work with people with disabilities in the last two, three years. And uh, mm -hmm. so, yeah, my learning curve has been huge. And I think a big part of it was um, at first, I I have to admit, I was afraid of uh, how they would behave, how they would, you know, uh, be, being a woman, whether they mm -hmm. I would be, be uh, molested. Um, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, just because they, they, they behave and look so different from me. And sure. uh, yeah, so, so. So yeah, I had to really look at uh, each person as who they were, rather than uh, focus on my fear. And yeah, mm. a lot of it went away very quickly. Yeah, I mean, I think anytime we're trying something new, right? Like if we're working with a population, you know, learning so much about it. And the thing of it is, is that, you know, in my program in graduate school, in my master's program and my doctorate program, I never learned anything about sex. That's why I was really grateful to ASEC to be able to start that process because even when I was in my Master of Social Work program, they never talked to us about sex therapy, human sexuality, or any of that. And it's just so needed because sexuality is just as important as our mental health. All of it is so critical. And just because you have an illness or disability, there's this big myth that you know, you're not sexual or you're asexual. Not that there's nothing wrong with asexuality, but people assume that because you are in a wheelchair or, you know, you have an inv invisible disability that, you know, you're, you're not sexual or because you have a diagnosis like cancer, um, you don't have desire and arousal. And we know that's not true. 
So I feel like a big part of the work that I do is really trying to crush that myth and normalize sexuality. Mm. So, mm. so for listeners out there who, who are new to this topic, um, I, I will have to say that at some point, uh, each and every one of us will have an illness or disability mm -hmm. and or disability uh, as we get older. That's just part mm -hmm. of life. And uh, the mm -hmm. more prepared we are, the better we will be placed. But for those of us who are not familiar with it, how would you define a disability, the types of disability or even what is a chronic illness? Well, you know, there's different, there's odd different types of disabilities out there. And, you know, a disability is basically, it's, it's, a, it's a physical or mental condition that really limits a person, right? And that can be with movement, that can be with their senses, it can be with activities, you know? And then we've got different ones. While there are shared impacts within the disability community, disability looks and feels different for everyone. So everyone has their own story with it. So, you know, we have congenital disability where that's a condition that they had since birth. We have acquired disability where, you know, they they have an acquired injury or the onset of an illness or disease. So for an example, if someone was in a car accident, um, that can lead to a disability. We have intellectual disabilities, conditions affecting intellectual ability or, you know, someone's mental capacity. And then of course we see invisible disability, chronic illness, mental illness, sensory problems of spectrum disorders. So there's like a whole realm of disabilities. And with a chronic illness, you know, it's basically an illness that has lasted for quite some time, most likely over three months, where we have an acute illness, like in some situations, the flu, right? Or even COVID. You can get COVID and what? You're, you get COVID and then 10 days later, COVID can be gone, right? But with a chronic illness, it's something that is is really it stays with us right so the traditional chronic uh which includes you know multiple sclerosis diabetes fibromyalgia i work with a lot of those patients um we have survivors of acute formerly fatal illnesses such as cancer we have um you know people with persistent acute illnesses such as hiv and aids um, we have chronic illnesses from the consequences of aging uh, but also with um, adults who've survived serious childhood illnesses, such as cancer, um, can be at higher risk of different medical uh, complications. So those are a lot of the illnesses that I work with. If we, if we take disability, the big population that I work with is definitely folks that have chronic illness, and, and most of them also have chronic pain conditions due to their illness. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Okay, that's great. It's a it's a very succinct uh, summary of uh, all the disabilities that mm -hmm. uh, that um, exist. And um, yeah, <laughs> so let's talk about uh, let's <laughs> let's let's. Move. It's, it's it's a lot, right? It's a lot. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, I I love how you you talk about it because uh, mm -hmm. it's it's obvious it's obvious your expertise uh, mm -hmm. in it, which is uh, impressive. So, what are some of the uh, we started to talk about some misconceptions of sex and disability, uh, about people having um, mm -hmm. um, being asexual, no sex right. drive, mm -hmm. and uh, the fears around um, navigating it. So um, besides those two, are, are there any other uh, misconceptions that maybe I, I don't know of? Well, I mean, I think the big one too is that, you know, there's the sex drive, but then there's the thing that you know, there are people aren't desirable. And I, I tend to see this in my work, especially for folks that are wheelchair users. Um, you know, there are people in the world who treat disabled people like they're desexualized children. So like they're literally like a child. And I found this to be true for people who have visible disabilities, which is called like infantilization or disabled people are often thought of being incapable or having their own wants and desires. Right. And so that's a big misconception. And so one of the things that we also see are people in interabled relationships where one partner is able body and the other one is not. And so people assume that maybe the one that's able body takes advantage of them or something. So that tends to come up too. And I think that we really need to, you know, really address that and what what happens. So those are the things that I really see in my practice sometimes. And I think we're starting to see more of that in the research and people are really starting to normalize 
sex and disability, which is a great thing. Yeah, it's really important. Yeah. And then yeah. there's also the fetishization of uh, people with disabilities of, uh, um, it's a, it becomes a kink, you know, the disability is a kink. Right. Yeah. Yeah. But what's great too, is that we're starting to see that, you know, kink can be very empowering for folks with disabilities and chronic pain. So that's a whole other world that's going on in the research that people are able to focus on their, their good pain versus their bad pain when it comes to BDSM. So we're starting to see a lot of things shift in the, in the sexuality and disability research, which is fascinating. Yeah. And I was uh, very, very surprised, um, uh, because I really started, uh, supporting people with disabilities only in the last two, three years. Uh, mm -hmm. I was very surprised last year that I came across this literature that says that uh, people on the autism spectrum are more likely to be asexual and more are more likely to be into kink. Yes, that is fascinating. That's actually very true. I've actually had patients in my practice where they have identified such that, where they have identified as... Um, autism spectrum, asexual, but very much involved in the kink community. Uh, they, uh, you know, like other neurodivergent folks, there's something with um, stimulating and just very fascinating about that. And they're also into science fiction. <laughs> yeah. fantasy, fantasy and science fiction. That's the other thing that comes up too. It's very fascinating. Yeah, I think one thing that is different for people um, with disabilities in, uh, compared to in Singapore, at least in my experience, um, is that uh, a lot of them are actually being protected, um, being uh, shielded away from society. And uh, as a result, they once they leave the, the special schools that they were in, uh, they lose contact with society, they don't have friends, then there's isolation, then there's mm -hmm. depression, and then there's all that whole uh, thing around, like, how do I find a partner? I will never have a partner. And so they very much um, um, have a lot of um, rage. Yes, absolutely. A lot of anger, a lot of rage, feeling disconnected, being iced out, being isolated. Absolutely. Yeah. So finding comfort in the kink community, right? That's what's great about the kink community is that it is a place for people to have a sense of community with each other, to be uplifted, and a lot of the kink spaces are disability friendly, which is amazing. And so we're finding people that are, are drawn to that. Yeah, um, <laughs> we can we can uh, be quite negative about 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 it all because, uh, mm -hmm. you know, like they 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 finish school, they cannot get a job, they're stuck at home, they're dependent on their parents and mm -hmm. then they have no money to go out. And so they don't go out and then they have no friends. And then when they do have friends, uh, they they don't really understand like social norms and boundaries. And so they end up like harassing their friends, stalking them. And um, mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. it, it's, it's, it's really, really, really hard. Um, is, it, is it different um, in, in the US? Like people are a lot more empowered? It's a, that's a really good question. I think they can be. I think it depends on where they live. I think it depends on the city that they're in. And also if the resources are there, you know, we tend to see quite a bit of resources here in the in the greater New York City area and also in Washington, D.C., but we need more resources. We need more spaces where folks with disabilities can go into and thrive and be able to explore their sexuality. You know, that's what's great about having different support groups. And that's what's great about having psychotherapy and sex therapy, that they have a space to be able to do that and to be able to experience pleasure in different ways, right? I mean, that's what's that's one of the things that I love about surrogate partner therapy, having a sex surrogate to work with someone who has a disability. I've worked with a lot of surrogates where they come in and they do some of that work and then they also work with me. So we start to see a shift in, in that type of dynamic where people can really explore their sexuality and receive the pleasure that they deserve. Um, and that's what's great about working with a sex therapist is that you, come into a space where you can just share that, right? And not be judged and not be shamed. And I think a lot of that goes on in the medical community where if someone goes in to see their medical provider, not all medical providers, because I've worked with a lot of wonderful medical doctors, but there are some where someone may go into their doctor's office and talk about sex. And the doctor is like, I, 
don't know how to help you. I don't know what to do. So I think we've done some great work, but I think we need more. Um, and just more people that are out there that are willing to really engage with this population. Definitely needed. But we do yeah. see a lot of empowerment with it as well. Yeah, I, I, um, ever since I started uh, working with people with disabilities, I also recognize my own faults, like um, how I haven't really thought about making, making my own events and my trainings more inclusive. And uh, yeah. yeah, like like this uh, auto live captioning thing on Zoom has uh, really evolved over the last two years uh, mm -hmm. because of COVID, right? Mm -hmm. So COVID. So, um, mm -hmm. so now I make sure all my virtual events have um, live captioning and uh, I do make it stated that I welcome people with uh, all uh, abilities and uh, mm -hmm. if they need accessibility, uh, accessible um, support, um, that they should just reach out and let me know. Like, it's really important that we really see them in our society and give them opportunities or sponsorships so that they can uh, have access. Absolutely. Yeah, have ac accessibility to things, right? Because again, they are, they're, they're just like everybody else and a lot of people are very sexual and they wanna be able to explore that and they wanna get creative. Um, you know, I have a lot of couples that I see where one partner has a disability and instead of looking at it like so much like a problem, they can look at it like an opportunity to get creative with each other and, and to have sexual empathy, which I think is really important. Having relational safety and connection to really allow someone to explore their erotic curiosity, which I think is amazing. So they can take those erotic risks that they wanna do and talk about their fantasies, talk about what they enjoy and to be able to have great sexual communication with their partners. I love it. I love it. I am so happy they have you. So for listeners uh, out there who, who don't really understand about how surrogacy work, uh, could you explain a little bit more? Well, one of the things with surrogacy work is that we look at the triadic model um, of that, where we have a surrogate partner, we have the client, and we have the therapist. And so in the beginning of that, all three people meet. The surrogate partner works with the client on really identifying, you know, what are their goals? And so they help them with emotional self-esteem building. They help them with sexual self-esteem building through a series of exercises. They are the ones that are able to facilitate touch with the client. And so what I do as a sex therapist is after the surrogate partner works with them, I see the client and we really process what happened in the session with the surrogate. What type of emotions came up for them? What type of feelings did they have? How did that spark desire? How did that spark arousal? You know, what were the key things that they really enjoyed? What were the things that they didn't like from it, you know? And the surrogate and I will also meet to discuss how things are going with the client as well. So what we find is there's this working relationship. It's really great for clients um, that have a disability where they've never experienced what it means to be sexual or they want to reclaim their sexuality due to having a disability, maybe in their prior life when they were not, when they didn't experience a disability, they were able to have a very successful sex life and then that changed. So they want to be able to reclaim that. I've worked with a lot of clients that have had sexual trauma. And what's interesting is that about 75% of my patients with sexual trauma have some type of pain condition or an illness condition. And so being able to work with someone on how to reclaim that. I'm a huge fan of surrogate partner therapy. I think it's wonderful. And I would love to see more sex therapists work with surrogate partners. I think it's amazing work. Yeah. So um, is it illegal? Uh, is it illegal in the whole of US or just certain cities? It's le it, it, a lot of cities have surrogate partners. I mean, here in New York City, we have them in Washington, D.C. area in San Francisco. I think in a lot of your big cities, your metropolitan areas, we see more surrogate partners. Uh, that folks can work with. And a lot of them travel. You know, one of my favorite uh, surrogate partners, uh, surrogate uh, partners, she travels between, you know, Northern, Mar uh, she travels from Maryland all the way to like Philadelphia to work with clients and also to San Diego. So we're really seeing more folks 
branch out and work with several different clients. Yeah. You know? what, do, what do you know about surrogacy outside of US? I don't know much about it. Okay. Okay. <laughs> I need to get out of the US. I need to go travel more. Oh, come to me. Come to me. I will. I will. I'll come to Singapore. We'll hang out. I've never been. I would love to. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. So, so I, um, uh, because, uh, uh, I did uh, Love Abilities, which is a virtual sexuality and disability festival mm -hmm. uh, three years ago. And mm -hmm. um, I organized it. And so there were a lot of uh, people from all around the world. And mm -hmm. so I was just curious about the access outside of uh, US. I know that th mm -hmm. there is uh, one uh, sex uh, worker agency uh, mm -hmm. in Canada, but I really don't know that much um, beyond US. So like recently, um, someone in Ireland um, mm. contacted me and um, and said was cheated twice by two different uh, sex workers who just basically took his money and didn't show up. Oh. That, that must have been so devastating. Um, and I, so. I really didn't know where to refer him to somebody who, uh, mm. you know, an agency that was more ethical. So yeah, that's why I was asking. Um, and also in some countries, um, their sex work, um, sex workers association are unionized or they have a presence. So mm -hmm. that's where mm -hmm. I, I feel people with disabilities can go and seek support from, from sex workers who are more sex um, positive and also more educated around working with clients with disability. So if that's not a sex surrogacy service or agency in your country, you can actually look for sex work uh, associations or unions or agencies. Um, and they should be able to better refer mm. you to somebody who's more able, uh, as opposed to like trying to look for individual ones who may not have as much of a training. Absolutely. Yeah. And it's different in the U.S. I mean, we see surrogate partner therapy, but there, yes, there are sex workers and we know that sex work is work and it should be legalized here in the States. And it's really not. I mean, a lot of that changed with... Um, you know, the Trump administration. And so a lot of sex workers have been forced to go back out on the streets. They haven't had the opportunities to advertise their services like they did in the past. So that's unfortunate. Um, but yeah, I, I agree. I, I completely agree with you. And I think that, you know, a lot of folks with disabilities can really benefit from seeing a sex worker and being able to enjoy that and really yeah. find out, you know, what's pleasurable to them. Absolutely. Yeah. Okay. We have a break and we'll be back after this. Okay. Ohm Times TV. Imagine becoming a super influencer. Reinvent yourself, invest in your brand, and then manifest your success with a robust spheric approach. Ohm Times Media and Broadcasting offers a unique and multifaceted way to become the spiritual and conscious influencer you deserve to be by putting your message across our powerful platform with its proven record of integrity and excellence. Through our produced shows, Ohm Times offers the opportunity to become a social media TV personality, a radio show host, an Ohm Times Magazine columnist, and a syndicated podcaster, all in one shot. By live streaming your show on Ohm Times TV and broadcasting it across the extensive Ohm Times radio and TV networks, you become more than a host. You become an ambassador and a force for positive change. Ohm Times, open yourself to the possibilities. If I could be you, and you could be me for just one hour. If we could find a way to get inside each other's minds. Walk a mile in my shoes. Walk, Walk a, a mile, mile in my, my shoes. Well, before you abuse, criticize and accuse. Walk, Walk a mile in my shoes. Hello, hello, we're back. And uh, my name is Martha. I'm a relationship counselor and clinical sexologist in Singapore. And um, I'm with Dr. Lee Phillips. 
who is a certified sex therapist and licensed uh, clinical social worker uh, in several cities. Uh, however, Dr. Lee Phillips' uh, practice is in New York City and Virginia. Uh, Washington? Washington? You go to Washington mm -hmm. as well? <laughs> yeah, it's, it's right outside of Washington where I practice in Virginia. Yeah, but I go into Washington all the time and a lot of my patients uh, are in Washington. Yeah. I got it. Because yeah. I'm not familiar with the, you know, uh, uh, the geography of US. Okay, so uh, remember, okay, all of you can go to uh, Dr. Lee Phillips' uh, website. That's uh, with two L uh, dot com, and also you can find Dr. Lee Phillips on Instagram and Facebook. Mm -hmm. So we are actually covering such an interesting and exciting topic, at least for me. Um, so just now we talked about the types of disability. We talked about some misconceptions around sex and disability. We talked about. Um, um, the possibility of seeking um, uh, support in terms of learning about sexual skills through surrogacy and also the possibility of looking for sex workers uh, in your city. So now I want to move on to, uh, uh, you know, like for those of us who perhaps uh, are not in tune about disabilities and the lives of people with disabilities, like why, why would you um, uh, say uh, pleasure is important and what are the consequences for ignoring pleasure? Yeah, you know, I mean, pleasure is the center of sexuality, you know, and we know that sexual pleasure is really only one form where we can engage in arousal, desire, romance, eroticism. You know, there's there's pain relief where we can work on releasing um, and resolving like old hurts, wounds, elemental pleasures where we engage in play, humor, movement, sound. There's like mental pleasures where we get curious, we learn, we engage in positive thinking. We have emotional pleasures where we can engage in gratitude, love, courage, enthusiasm. And then we've got sensual pleasures where we can take delight in our senses. And then we've got spiritual pleasures where we can feel part of something that's really good, which I think is important. And all of these pleasures are really critical when reclaiming intimacy uh, due to chronic illness and disabilities. You know, Because I think sometimes when we hear the word pleasure, we think of sex, but there's all different types of pleasures. And I like to talk about that with my clients because sometimes they have such a difficult time engaging in desire and arousal. So they wanna be able to find out what else can I get involved in, right? So that's critical. Ignoring pleasures, I think is, you know, what it comes down to is that if we do not include, you know, like a discourse of pleasure, people with disabilities, they may perpetuate their asexual status and victimization status, right? Again, you know, we covered that, you know, there's nothing wrong with asexuality, but there's this assumption that if you have a disability that you are asexual. And I think negative sexual messages about people with disabilities, they really fuel negative attitudes and misguided beliefs about sexual potential. And they can really take a toll on someone's sexual self-esteem. And what we find is low sexual self-esteem combined with the likes of physical limitations, diminished sensation, lack of escalating arousal, difficulty with ejaculation, difficulty with orgasm may cause sex and sexual relationships seem pointless, right? And I think that can be damaging. So we really have to look at what's critical when it comes to pleasure. And, you know, I always say you got to get curious and you got to get creative. And so the, that's my thing about pleasure that I think is really um, important, you know? Be and then if you talk about sexual pleasure, we know that sexual pleasure is very different from performance-based sex, right? So being able to do that, I think is really important. Yeah. Yeah. Great. <clears throat> so by you saying uh, sex uh, that is about performance and sex that is pleasure, so mm -hmm. just to elaborate mm -hmm. on it, on it uh, what I understand is, is pleasure for pleasure's sake. You know, we just do something not because we have to arrive anywhere. We just do it because it feels good, it's fun. And mm -hmm. whereas performance sex uh, actually makes uh, comes from a place of a lot of pressure, in my yes. experience. Pressure yes. in the sense of uh, people people feeling like, oh, I need to do this for someone, I need to do this or else. And uh, that pressure, uh, that performance element um, is always um, going to result in more and more um stuckness around it mm -hmm. absolutely yeah there's a there's a big difference and i think sometimes when people have something like a chronic illness they feel like there may be pressure 
because their bodies changed. And so what happens is, you know, with, with performance-based sex, we know that penetration, it's really the main act of sex. And someone that has a chronic illness or a disability, they may not be able to have penetrative sex. So they feel that pressure. We also know that with performance-based sex, sex ends with ejaculation, right? Well, if you've got a chronic illness and disability, you may not be able to achieve that. Um, with performance-based sex, it often includes rigid expectations of your own body or your partner's body. So what we find is someone that has a disability, they may have body image concerns. And so because they have those body image concerns, they may feel pressure or low sexual desire. They may feel anxious about not having an orgasm. They may feel anxious about satisfying their partner. Can I still satisfy my partner uh, due to my illness or my disability? Often there's limited clear communication in performance-based sex. There's really, <laughs> when you think about it, there's no communication that's really going on. And we know that sex at its heart, it's all about communication. And then the focus of attention is on our thoughts. We get stuck in our head, right? So when you're feeling very anxious during sex, that can cause issues, you know, in your genitals or wherever parts of your bodies, because we know that the brain is the powerhouse of sex. So that that's really important. And, and one of the things, that's the one thing that I stress with my with my patients that have a chronic illness or some other type of disability that it doesn't have to be about performance. It can be about pleasure. And so when we're looking at pleasure based sex, we look at, um, it includes multiple activities, right? There's all kinds of things that we can engage in. The skin is the largest sex organ, you know? So we can get very creative with that. We can, we have an agreement of what sex is and what it includes in a collaboration. During sex, there are regular check-ins that are happening with your partner. Um, it's safe, sane, and consensual. Orgasm is a bonus, but it's not required, right? It can include um, different body parts and accessories as well, which is really important. And one of the things that tends to come up too is that arousal is allowed to come before desire. We see that a lot. We see that with folks that don't have a disability or a chronic illness. They are able to achieve arousal first and then they have desire. So for an example, when I work with a lot of my female patients, they may experience that beforehand. In pleasure-based sex, it does not require or expect anything from any personal body. So no erections, vaginal wetness, specific body type ability or skills really needed. And it ends when a person wants it to end. So I think that is really important when we're really looking at sexuality altogether, but when we're really working with folks that have a disability, because they may be limited in certain things. And for an example, they may have, you know, uh, they may not be able to restore uh, sensation parts of their body. So then again, we take if that's the genitals, we remove that from the focus and we focus on other things. And so I think that's really important because then that starts to normalize the fact that we don't have to have this pressure. We can just have pleasure. Mm, I love it. And I love <laughs> um, um, what you said. I love everything that you said, but one of the things that I love is uh, for me, for me, um, pleasure is about feeling alive. And uh, yeah. pleasure is about expression. And um, pleasure reminds us all of like, it's good to be here. And so when we link it with, if you don't have a healthy sex self-pleasure, mm -hmm. then uh, you're going to start thinking all the things that you mentioned, which is it can lead to sexual difficulties. It can lead to this sense of like, it's pointless. And uh, mm -hmm. so, I, I, so it's so important what you said that we focus on the pleasure rather than on the performance, and we allow our and we allow our bodies to have a chance to have the arousal before the desire. By that I mean like you don't have to like wait until you feel like it. You just do it, and then you allow your body to have a chance to experience the uh, arousal, and then see where you want to go with it. Right, absolutely. And we know that there's a difference between spontaneous desire versus responsive desire, where some people with spontaneous, they think about sex, they can have it. But for other folks, it's responsive desire. 
sometimes they have to be worked into things, right? It's not going to happen immediately. And I think there's this um, idea, and, and you know this, that sex is spontaneous. But when you have a chronic yeah. illness, a lot of times it has to be planned. If someone is chronically ill and they have more energy levels in the morning, they're going to plan sex in the morning. You know, yeah. as opposed to having it at night because they're going to be tired by then. They may take their medication at five, six o'clock p.m. and then they're going to go to sleep. So we have to change yeah. that up. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. We have to make sex work for us, not work hard for sex. <laughs> <laughs> right. Yeah. What works for us, right? Everyone's different, you know, and we have to think about. What does that look like? The other thing too, is that there's a grief process that comes with chronic illness and disability. So sometimes someone's going through their grief, they may be in denial about their condition. So when they're in denial about their condition, the last thing they want is sex, they get angry about it. So if they're feeling a lot of anger, they may not want sex, they're bargaining, doing and saying that they would do anything to have their body back. And then of course, depression plays a big factor into it. When people have depression, we see a lot of things that happen. We can see um, sexual challenges such as erectile dysfunction. We can see low desire and arousal that tends to come up all the time. And then the last phase of grieving is acceptance. Now, acceptance mm -hmm. is not positive or negative. It's just where you're at in the moment. Yeah. And sometimes when you're in that present moment and acceptance, then you can achieve pleasure. So, yeah. yeah. Yeah, it's like fighting with yourself. All the time. Yeah, all the time. Always in this battle with your illness. And I think the powerful thing uh, that people can achieve is that when they can realize that their illness is only one part of them, it doesn't have to define who they are, you know? And so when they can get to a point of that, then they can experience pleasure in the way that they want to experience pleasure. Yeah, that's so important. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, when you're, you're, you, yeah, we're, you know, when we are in denial, we're pushing away as opposed to, uh, as opposed to finding solutions or working through things. And mm -hmm. like you said, uh, acceptance is a big part of shift. Uh, also, also the, the access, you know, so, so anyway, <laughs> I'm all over the place. <laughs> I'm all over yeah. the place. You can, hey, when you're talking about this topic, you can go all over the place. I mean, uh -huh. you know, I mean, it's such an important topic and it's so easy to just do that, right? There's so many yeah. avenues. And I think it's actually, it's, it's complicated because a lot of times, you know, people have to go through a grief process, you know, and sometimes I have people that will come in and see me and they're like, okay, I've already grieved my body. I've already accepted things for what they are. I want to have sex. And I'm here to see you, Dr. Lee, because I want to know how to do that. How do I go about doing that? How do I do, when I go out on a date, if I'm single, do I disclose to someone that I'm chronically ill on the first date? Do I wait? Do I put it on my dating app? You know, but it really depends on where everyone's at in their own journey. Mm, yeah. You know? Yeah. Yeah. I love it when uh, they shift from denial to acceptance. Yes. Uh, because very, yeah. I see, I see the power coming to them. Mm -hmm. It's very powerful. Their faces, their body, it just changes. It does. It changes. It changes everything about them. They really start to develop a sexual self-esteem about themselves and what they really want. And they're in this body acceptance. There's this great deal of body positivity that's there. That they love their body for what it is and they can explore different things. You know, a lot of the couples that I've worked with where there's been a chronic illness, um, you know, they really do look at it like an adventure. It's like, oh, you have more energy in the morning. Let's have morning sex. We're used to have it in the evening. You know, let's, let's get creative with this. We can get more toys. We can do more. We can explore more, you know? So there's many different avenues that people can go into and look at it like an adventure. And I think that's what's so amazing about sex educators and sex therapists is that we do that for them. We help normalize sexuality because people really do come in thinking they are damaged. Like how do, is my, my body is broken. And I'm like, no, your body's not broken. You know, there's ways to reclaim this. There's ways to talk through it. A lot of people feel about a, a lot of shame about their disability. And so a lot of times we have to work through the shame, you know? So there's a lot of work that has to be done before someone just jumps into having sex. 
And I think people need to know that. Um, Cause a lot of people think that people come in and see me and they're like, okay, I want to go right into sex. But a lot of times they really want to focus on other things. I think there's also this assumption that because I am a chronic illness therapist that I'm just focusing on chronic illness. Patients come in to see me because they know that I'm aware of chronic illnesses. So when they come in, they may not even be wanting to talk about their chronic illness. They may want to talk about their depression, their anxiety. They may want to talk about their fetish. They may want to talk about their kink. They may want to explore non-monogamy and polyamory. So there's like a lot of different things that bring people in. Yeah. Yeah. It's really, really uh, important to get support because uh, we only know what we know. And uh, when you go to somebody who is more experienced, who is trained, who's qualified, uh, who has dedicated their lives to supporting people with illnesses and disabilities, mm -hmm. like there's no need to keep suffering in silence. There is, right. uh, there are options and there are better ways, ways that can work for you, whatever that may be. Yeah, so, whatever it may be. Absolutely. And really just gain those resources. And like what you were saying, one of the things that I always ask my patients is who's your support outside of therapy? Who do you go to? you know, is it an online support group? You know, during COVID, we had online, right? So it's really being able to find what works for you. Yeah, I love that. Mm -hmm. um, so so on that note, I think we have we have a, a, a sense of uh, the kind of interventions and how you support clients, yeah. uh, many, many examples. So what I really want to know is for people who do not have a disability, who are caregivers, parents of people with disabilities, or friends of people with disabilities, like what should we be thinking about in terms of supporting our friends with disabilities and mm -hmm. especially around their sexuality? That's it. I love that you're saying that because I think that we have to, some people have to realize, you know, they are able bodied and there's a lot of privilege when it comes to that. And I think one of the biggest things that people can do, and I think there's a lot of power in this, and I think it's one of the best interventions that I use every day in my work is to listen, just be, have empathy, listen to people, no matter what that is, no matter what they want to say and validate them, validate their experiences. Oh. Because if someone can do that, then people will talk more about their sexuality when they feel safe, when they don't feel judged, when they don't feel shamed, when they can show up in a sex positive space to be able to talk about that. When they can really have a sex positive space with their disability, the things that they can start talking about is things about sex that make me feel excited, things about sex that make me feel anxious, parts of my body that I like being touched, parts of my body that are off limits, words that I like my body and, and genitals to be, to be called, right? Sexual acts that I wanna try and a thing that I may need help with. If someone does not feel heard, they're gonna do two things. They're either gonna lash out or they're gonna go into their shell. They're gonna withdraw. And I think that that's something that we can really understand. And just because someone is not a wheelchair user doesn't mean that they, they don't have a disability. Just because someone is walking around, they are somewhat able body, they can bend down, they can touch, they can, they can do things, they can walk, they still may have a disability. They can have an invisible illness. And I think, you know, there's a lot of judgment that goes into that. And so I think that we need to get curious about people. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's great. Yeah. yeah so listening being curious, validating their experiences, and then just yeah. letting it unfold so that they can feel safe to talk about sex. Because if there isn't any trust, you don't, you, you can't just go in and say, tell me about your sex life or, you know, <laughs> yeah. Right. I know, I know, you know, I wouldn't feel comfortable either, right? I wouldn't want to do that as well, you know? But if I feel like I can be heard and I'm not going to be judged, and I'm not going to be shamed, then I can talk about anything that I want to, right? And so that's why sometimes it's important to have a sex therapist so someone can understand them. Because I feel like sometimes family and friends, they can be the first to love you, but they can also be the first to judge you. Yeah, and also yeah. from that place of wanting to help you, they yeah. may be telling you things that's not helpful at all. <laughs> That's so true, you know, because I have patients that come in and they're like, my mom said this or my friend said this, right? And it was not helpful to me.
So really being able to find someone that you can really connect with and also just the community, seeing what's in your community, doing the research, um, having your friends research things. That's what's great about social media. You know, there's just so many uh, support groups out there. And some people really do, if they don't have that in their area where they live, they rely on social media. They rely on Instagram, you know, with our stories. And, you know, I, you know, Martha, you're very popular on Instagram. So. <laughs> I look so hot. I'm not sure how popular. You're more popular than me. <laughs> you work really hard. You work, I work very hard. You do work. You work very hard. I, I, see, I, I see your hard work all the time. Oh. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> it's so hot. I want to cry. <laughs> <laughs> People have no yeah. idea. Yeah. 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 You, you work very, very hard. Absolutely. Oh. And, and people rely on us. You know, it's nice. They, we, we give them something. And I think that's really important in the field that we're in. Absolutely. Yeah. So, so of course, you know, I'm, I'm blown away by your compassion and your expertise and all mm -hmm. the things that you know, and all the ways that you can support somebody with disability, but there's always that concern around like, how can I, how, like, how can I hire you, uh, Dr. Lee Phillips, if uh, they're not in your city, because people with disabilities, of course, um, may have, um, issues around accessibility and travel and things like that, money. So how can how can people uh, get support from you? Well, you can always reach out to me on Instagram, you know, at Dr. Lee Phillips. I'm I'm always on social media. I check I check my messages. Um, I even check my you know how when someone can send you a request, like if they don't if you don't follow them and they want to message you, they can I check those because someone may be needing some help or they may want to collaborate. You know, you can always email me at drleephillips at gmail.com. You can go to my website, drleephillips.com, and I'd be more than happy to answer any of your questions. If you also go to my website, there is a resource page where I have all of my resources um, with different, you know, uh, books that you can look at. Um, you know, my podcast is about to launch again in April, the Sex and Chronic Illness podcast. Um, which I'm really excited about. I've been on a little bit of a hiatus with that because I opened my practice. So stay tuned to that. I'm going to have some great guests on there. Martha, you're going to be one of them. So you'll be coming on my Thank podcast. <laughs> and just yeah. some really great people. Yeah, it'll be fun. Yeah, I forgot that you did. You do have your podcast. I do. I do. It's been a while since I've done an episode. It's launching again in April which I'm really excited about um, with all new content, new um, sex experts on there, sex educators, uh, uh, real people out there that have chronic illness and disability. So it's going to be really nice. I'm really looking forward to it just to get the word That's out great. there more. Absolutely. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah. yeah, we need many voices. And uh, it's just so unfortunate that there's so many misconceptions around disabilities and sexuality mm -hmm. still. And uh, the messages the uh, cannot stop. You know, it, it it takes all of us to uh, keep plugging this because there mm -hmm. are people who are suffering and there are people who um, just need yeah. access. They need access. They need people to talk to, and it definitely takes a village. So absolutely, we definitely need more people out there. And so that's what hopefully we're gonna we're gonna get. You know, by spreading that word out there for people. So. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I've loved this episode. Uh, is there any other um, things that you would like to share? Last words, comments? I have a mantra and my mantra has always been get curious about your partner and get creative with your sex. I love it. Yeah. <laughs> I love it so much. Get create, get curious, get creative. Mm -hmm. That's what it's about. Get curious and get creative no matter what that looks like. Yeah, to me it's uh to me it's play. Sex is play, mm -hmm. and we need to approach it from that that angle of it's it's part of uh, returning to our inner child, and it doesn't need to be so serious. It it is fun. It's funny, and um, 
if we just approach it that way, I think we cannot fail. Mm -hmm. I agree with you. I think it's all about play. It's about fun, right? That's what pleasure is. That's what it is. So I think it's being able to engage in that. And sometimes that may be by exploring your own pleasure and exploring other people's pleasures. And sometimes that's taking to talk to a therapist or an educator about it and to be able to find that for yourself. Definitely needed. I love it. So is there anything that's coming up? Uh, what else uh, besides your podcast? So I, um, you know, I do a lot of speaking engagements. I also teach for a few sex therapy institutes. So stay tuned for that. Um, you know, I'm always trying to engage with an audience in some type of way, whether that's through media, my podcast, social media um, that I have going on that I'm really excited about. But I've really been focusing more on the podcast, which I'm really looking mm -hmm. forward to. I'm hoping to do about one to two episodes a month to start out with. So that's going to be really fun and exciting. Yeah. yeah. Um, podcasts are really powerful for people who live with their family and yeah, just get away <laughs> and have some privacy away from them to be able to get your sex education without feeling, you know, that they're breathing down your throat or not, neck or something. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah. Having your privacy, having a place where you can explore that and that's what it's about. Right. I think that's so important. Yeah. Okay. So we're going to wrap up. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Lee Phillips, for being here. And uh, please uh, yeah. check out his website and also his Instagram, Facebook. And that's uh, Dr. Lee Phillips with two L's uh, yeah. dot com. Yes. Thanks for Thank having you. me. Bye. Bye.